morning, good morning, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, let me say that I am Brenda Salter. I'm the Family and Consumer Science Agent with Fort Valley State University Extension. And I'm uh, located in Marion County. Uh, also, I am going to be your host today, along with Ms. Ida Jackson, uh, who is from the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Program. She's a facts agent there, as well as a FNEP uh, supervisor and educator. Uh, so we are your hosts for today. We have an, a, a beautiful program for you today, and we're going to go ahead and get started uh, on that program. All of you want to thank you for coming uh, if you have pen and paper, go ahead and grab that. If you don't, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started on our program today. Let me share with you what Georgia FITS is. The acronym stands for Georgia FITS. Georgia FITS stands for Georgia Farmers Initiative for Training and Sustainability. And Georgia FITS is simply a collaboration between the University of Georgia uh, Cooperative Extension Service, as well as Fort Valley State University Extension Program. And these two universities, along with uh, nonprofit, along with federal, state, nonprofit, and some private firms that have come together just to bring awareness and outreach along the area of estate planning and asset management in the state of Georgia. So we put this program together today, uh, uh, who gets the home house to trust or not to trust, in order to share some of that information with you. And so without further ado, I'm going to change, turn it over to Ms. Ida Jackson. She's going to introduce some of the other panelists with Georgia Fit and uh, give us some house notes and a, a rundown of our agenda today. And then I'll come back and introduce our speaker and we'll get started for why you came today. OK, thank you, Ms. Ida. Thank you, Brenda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, allow me to introduce our team. We have Keyshawn Thomas with UGA Extension in Bibb County. We have Millicent Price, Titus Andrews, Joshua Dawson, and Philip Pepway. They're all with the Fort Valley State University Corporate Extension. Um, our agenda today is as follows. We have um, topics that we will address um, concerning trust. What are trusts? What types of trusts are there? Do I need a trust? How do I update a trust? Trust versus last will and testament and skills, knowledge, ask of the administrator. Between each of those topics, there will be time for questions. We ask that you please type your questions in the chat box and our uh, moderator, Keyshawn Thomas, will facilitate those questions to the attorney. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible in respect of time. Also, please understand more complex and, and or specific questions for the sake of time and or above the scope of this program will not be answered and you may need to seek um, consultation with an attorney. If this is the case, you will um, be advised of that in the chat as well. Thank you again for joining us and for your attention. I'm gonna turn it back over to Brenda. All right, thank you, uh, Ida. And we again welcome all of you. I hope you made yourself comfortable and ready for uh, informative program today. I'm, I have the task of introducing our speaker that we have with us today, so I'll do that now. Uh, Attorney John Duns Dunsbach is a founding member and managing partner of John of Dunsbach Law Group, LLC. His practice focuses in the area of business finance and formation, estate planning, probate and estate administration, as well as individual tax planning and taxation and real estate. Uh, Attorney Dunsbach uh, received his master's in law degree uh, taxation from and in taxation from Boston University in 2000. And in 2000 and in 1999, he received his JD degree from the University of Alabama. Uh, Attorney Dunsbach is is uh, a major in economics from Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt uh, University uh, with a bachelor's, bachelor's degree in business in a minor in business administration in 1996. He was admitted to the bar, uh, the state bar exam in Alabama in 99, in Georgia in 2000, and the state bar of South Carolina in 2001. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience in 
extensive experience in estate planning in probate in corporate and corporate practice experience. He's also um, been, uh, he's involved in drafting as well as in litigation matters and in the state and the federal courts of Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, Attorney Dunsbach is also has um, real estate practice. He had with his real estate practice now, he handles uh, numerous uh, residential and commercial real estate closings on an annual basis. And he's currently a title agent with Chicago Title Insurance Company in both Georgia and South Carolina. He, he, um, he is a member of the Augusta Estate Planning Council, the Augusta Bar Association, executive Com committee member of the fiduciary section of the State Bar of Georgia. And if that is what we're going to be talking. His uh, training is going to be sharing with us today in the area of trust. Uh, so he's also not only is he well known and respected and highly uh, admired in his professional career, but attorney John Steinbach is also uh, involved in civic and community activities, being the committee chair of the Boy Scout Troops 10 at the Church of Holy Comfort, as well as a member of the Wesley United Methodist Church. So he is uh, also respected by his peers. He was honored in the Atlanta Magazine of, uh, of for Georgia Super Lawyers from the Rising Star Edition. So we are so pleased to have a uh, very qualified speaker to talk with us today on the matters of trust as it relates to our estate plans. So without further ado, I'm going to ha hand the mic over and ask all of you to welcome uh, Attorney John Dunsbach. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate that. And um, as you said, today we're going to talk about trusts. Um, and one of the things that I always like to do before we talk about trust, just kind of talk about one of the basic aspects of estate planning, which are wills. Um, because often the debate and the decision comes down to, well, do I need a will? Do I need a trust? How does this work? And so, as you can see from the, the first slide that, that, that I've got up that's going to be posted up is, is do I need a will? And so, for some people, the concern is to avoid estate taxes, which for most folks is not a concern because the estate tax exemptions are really, really high now. They're currently at about $13 million per person. And, you know, for the average person out there, they're not concerned about avoiding taxation with their documents. Um, but what is important when you do have an estate plan or will is it determines the disposition of your assets for one. And this this is in the context of a will or trust, because I would say that a trust is really a more advanced version of a will and necessary. And we're going to get into that in a little bit about why I might need a trust or what the important aspects of trusts are. But everybody should have at minimum the will, the base plan, which helps determine those disposition of assets, who you want to receive it, who, what happens to it. Maybe I've got kids or people who can't handle assets correctly. So I wanna manage those for their benefit. Maybe I've got people who aren't good with assets, so I need to protect those assets. Uh, maybe I've got a blended family with kids from different families, and maybe I've got different children from different parents, and so we wanna avoid disputes and fights and lay that out. Uh, maybe I've got minor children who need guardians and other people appointed until they're 18. Um, and just generally speaking, a will will help ensure that you're protected and your assets go the way you want. Uh, and that's why it's important. So everybody at a base level should have a will. Uh, because if you don't, the state of Georgia has a written one for you. And the code sections of Georgia determine who gets your assets if you don't write your own will or set up a trust. And a lot of people are a little surprised to realize that, that it goes to spouse or family members or kids in certain ways that they don't intend for it to happen. For instance, if you have a house and you don't have a will and that house has a mortgage on it, if you pass away, your spouse and kids inherit the house. 
And so for the spouse to deal with the mortgage on the house, she's got to work through it with the kids because the kids now own an interest in the house, which is a lot of times what people don't want to see happen. So I would encourage anybody and everybody out there who is in that position to certainly make sure that at a base they have a will. Because that's the next slide that discusses kind of what happens if we don't have a will. And then that's what we were talking about with the state of Georgia in determining that, which is, you know, this is exactly what happens. If you have a spouse, they're the sole heir. Maybe you don't want your spouse to get it. Maybe you have certain assets you want to go to a certain way. If you have children and a spouse, then the children will share equally as long as the spouse gets at least a third of it. So for instance, somebody who has two kids, their spouse is going to get a third of that house and the kids two thirds of it. Well, that's often a shocking result for people if when they think that everything should go to their wife or husband and, if they, and they don't have a will or trust set up. So and then, and then it even gets more difficult. Let's say you don't have a spouse or kids. Then you see the degrees of kinship. It goes back to your parents, sometimes siblings, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, those type of folks. So you can have some really odd and unusual disposition of assets if you haven't done a planning and set something up for your family. Uh, and oftentimes we end up with things that people don't intend or don't intend them to be. Uh, perfect example, the one that's not on this list, if you go far enough down, I've had people who don't have parents or siblings or grandparents or uncles or kids, it ends up going to the state of Georgia. And I, I can tell you right now, most people, when they hear that, are thinking, that's not what I want to have happen at all. And so without a will or trust in place, that's what could happen. And so, again, we will always encourage people to make sure that they have those documents in place and that it's taken care of. Because if you don't, this is what the state of Georgia has determined your will is, regardless of what you decide or want to have happen. So, and, and you know, and the ne next, I guess the next part is, you know, who are my kids? It amazes me the number of times in estates or plans where we have all sorts of different type of kids show up. I've got kids that are half siblings or brothers, or I've got an adopted child. I've got one case right now where we have two adopted children, three half siblings, and two actual biological children by the current parents. It, as you can imagine, is a mess going on because they did not designate a will or trust to deal with it. And so we are having a real fight over the assets in the estate and what's going on and, and actually a determination of who the kids are. Um, we've had situations that children were born after the death of somebody. They're what we call a child in gestation, uh, which means if you have if you're expecting and you pass away, that child is still your heir and they, they can be and will be. And so oftentimes wills and trusts are important even before you have kids, because you can designate in those documents what happens if you do have kids or are planning to have kids. And so you don't have some unintended consequence happen if you do have kids. You can even draft documents prior to getting married and say what happens if you do decide to get married. Now, I would tell folks if they have a document and they want to get married uh, and they do get married, that they want to look at changing their documents because the marriage will invalidate a will that you have drafted up to a one-third interest for that new spouse. Now, that's not necessarily true for a trust, and that's where trusts have an advantage over wills in certain marital situations because they, they help protect from that. And so there, there are varying family situations that can happen that make it important to do that. And so, you know, the, the example that I've set out of, of where something really bad can happen without a will, which is the next slide on here, is the example provision that, that lays out uh, kind of a scenario that we've seen happen that happens more frequently than people think about when they're doing wills and trusts. This is the situation that we see happen really frequently that people don't think about, even when they do a will or some sort of planning for instance, in this case, I've got Fred and Wilma who are married and they have a kid together, and they also have two children from prior relationships. So Fred has one and Wilma has one. Well, 
the, the pro or in this case, I think the example was two each. So the, the problem you have with this is if they die without wills or trust documents, those kids are going to inherit to the extent they are the child of the biological parent. So in this case, I've got Fred passed away first. He didn't have a will. Wilma gets a third of his estate and then their children. Their one child together gets a portion of it. And then his two kids get a portion of it. Wilma's other children by a relationship are left out because she didn't die. And so, as you can see, it creates really unintended consequences that can happen. Uh, and, and the worst one I think that we've ever seen happen is folks had kids by both had prior relationship. None of they didn't have kids together. They got married. One of them passed away. They left everything to their surviving spouse. That spouse went back to an attorney who actually drafted this. They drafted a new will that left everything to a new spouse that they married. Then that spouse died and both sets of kids inheritance went to a totally different third party spouse who cut them out completely. And so that all could have been avoided had either proper will planning or trust planning been done with those assets so that that could be avoided. And that's why it's important because as I said, we see that happen more frequently than it should. And that's the point of this type of planning, which is to avoid those type of things. Now, and, and people often ask, well, you know, and, and with the next slide, we can see kind of what we're dealing with. They say things like, oh, I don't have an estate. I, I don't need to do planning or anything with an attorney. Well, everybody sitting in this room or looking at this presentation has some aspect of these assets. And they are all treated differently and handled differently within the probate context. For instance, insurance proceeds and retirement planning assets, 401ks, IRAs, annuities. Almost everybody I've ever met has some level of those, whether it be a small insurance policy or a retirement plan or an IRA or something like that. And those are controlled to a lot of people's surprise, not necessarily by a will or trust document, but by the actual beneficiary forms that they have. And so it's really, really important that if you're meeting with somebody to do either will or trust planning, that they first ask you these questions. What do you have? Because I can't even tell you if you need a trust if I don't know what you have. And certainly if I'm not asking you what you have, I am the wrong guy to be doing your planning because I there's no way to do your planning and do it right without knowing these things. Do you have insurance? Do you have 401ks and IRAs? Do you have an investment account with stocks and bonds in it? Do you have cash? Where, where are your bank accounts? How many do you have? Do you have certificates of deposit, bonds, treasuries, all those things? Because they all are treated differently sometimes for income tax purposes and how they're transferred. Do you have real property? Do you have a house, beach house, farm, timberland? Is it located in Georgia or some other state? Uh, those are all important questions to know because in what you may have a way you want it to go or be dealt with. And if the attorney or the person working with you is not asking you those questions, you've got the wrong person because they're not a planner. They're just there to print out a document and they're not helping you work through what you may ultimately need. The same is true with personal property. Cars and boats have car titles that have to get properly transferred. And we see that happen a lot of times where people put either the spouse on it or don't put the spouse on it. We end up having to go through probate or, or deal with retitling or other things related to that. So anybody you're working with in either the will or trust context better be asking you these questions and better be asking you the questions about what you have so that they can put it together for you. And you know, I, I, the, the, the myths that we see, which is my next slide here, that we often see when people come to us to do a will or trust planning, a lot of these things come up in our discussion of, do I need a will? Do I need a trust? What's, what's the difference? You know, they, they hear that probate's bad and something they don't want to go through, and that's why they need and have to have a trust. Well, that's not always true. 
there are, there are times where it makes just as much sense to have a will as it does a trust. Now, there are times to do a trust too. And we're going to, as I said, talk about that in some more detail here in a second. But the, 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 that's a common misconception that if I've got to go through probate, that's a bad thing. Um, also, the idea that revocable trust will save me estate taxes or protect me from creditors or, or do those type of things. That's not always true and typically is not true. It certainly doesn't save taxes and it doesn't protect you from creditors. They can still come after the revocable trust or trust that you set up if it's revocable. Now, an irrevocable trust is a little different. We'll talk about those in a minute too. That's a permanent trust that you set up and kind of lock assets away in. And, and there are reasons and, and why you want to do those as well. But most people, when they're doing this type of planning, want to do what we call a revocable trust, where it's fully amendable or can be changed at any time. And because they, they don't know until they die, they don't want it to have to be a permanent disposition. They want to have the right to be able to change it. And the other aspect that we see is the revocable trust help me avoid probate. Well, again, that's not always true because if it's not in the trust, oftentimes you will have to go through probate with an asset. For instance, a bank account, a car title, a trailer title, you know, boat title. Any of those type things will end up putting you into probate and having to retitle those through uh, the probate process. One of the common ones we see that happens that people don't think about that creates the need to go to probate is a tax refund. You know, they think they've got their planning done, everything's set up great, they've done revocable trust planning, so everything's outside the probate process. Person passes away and then Uncle Sam cuts the check back to them in their name. Well, now I've got to go open a probate to be able to cash that check. So there are sometimes things that happen in a probate and, and trust planning standpoint that it's hard to avoid having to probate something because you know, it just is because of the nature of people's assets. And, you know, the other myth that we get a lot in our office is, I don't need, I don't need all these fancy documents or anything. I just left everything in joint name with my spouse. I got everything named to the kids and, and spouse on my IRAs and 401ks. There's not gonna be a problem with that. I put my adult child on the account to help access it. I don't need those powers of attorney or other, other forms like that. Or, I, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I, I don't have, a, I'm not a millionaire. I don't have a lot of need for estate planning. Well, all of that is not true because if, if you have joint property, it's going to go to that joint owner. I, we have had situations where people have titled bank accounts to a, a child and they've got other kids and suddenly at death, that bank account goes to that one child. And I can't tell you the number of times that that child looks at me and says, you know, mom and dad really did love me that much. I'm keeping the account. And that is very shocking for the siblings when that happens. And had mom or dad done trust planning or will planning, that could have been avoided. The same is true with beneficiary designations on policies and retirement accounts. Maybe you want to manage those funds because they've grown to such a level that they're, they're a large amount of money. And you want to manage those for kids or spouse or other people. And you want to do some trust planning with those. Well, that's that's important because if you give it to them outright, they're going to get it. And it's even more important if you've got minor children, because if you leave them as beneficiaries on a retirement account and something happens to you and your spouse, which is what we see happen frequently when this pops up, you know, people with young kids, they set up their retirement beneficiaries at work and they name their spouse and then just throw their kids on the form and then both parents die in a car accident, now I've got a problem because I've got to go get a guardianship and conservatorship for the kids. Whereas if I'd done some trust planning in either the will or revocable trust context, I could have avoided that cost. And so those are all important things to consider when you're considering planning and doing planning and why it makes sense. Uh, and, and if we slide down a couple slides, we'll see the, the slide at this point of, you know, what is a trust and, and why, why, what, what, what is a trust? Because that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. And, you know, a trust under Georgia law is something, it's, it's, it's actually a legal entity that holds title to real or personal property. So when you are setting up a trust, just like when you go buy a car, you would title your car in the name of that trust or the trustee of that trust. So if John Smith sets up a trust and he puts a car in it, he titles the car over to 
John Smith as trustee of his trust. And it's a step that a lot of people, when they're doing trust, fail to properly handle or do, which is get the assets actually into the trust or title them over to it. And so, you know, that is a very, very important step for you to take if you are doing trust planning. The other part is the trust is, is a legal entity unto itself, and it has a party acting as its trustee who is handling the affairs of the trust. They're making all the fiduciary decisions. They're making all of the management administration decisions. They're making all the financial investment decisions. And, you know, the question we often get is, well, who can do that? Well, it's a tough job. And it's often a job that you want somebody who you feel you trust, no, no pun intended, but that you believe can handle the responsibilities of that because they have to be able to handle finances. They have to be able to handle administration of the assets and follow the trust terms and distribute it in accordance with the trust. And, you know, a lot of people look at me and say, well, gosh, wouldn't you be a great trustee as a lawyer or, or my accountant or my financial guy is going to be a great trustee? Well, I'll be honest, my experience over the years is that's not true. Uh, particularly accountants are terrible trustees because this time of year is a perfect example. Has anybody ever tried to get their CPA from January to April 15th of any tax season? They are impossible to get a hold of. Lawyers, myself, we are very, very difficult to get a hold of because we're doing all sorts of other things. And you want to have somebody who is a trustee is available, is, is able to jump on doing something. Like if, if it owns a piece of real estate and there's a plumbing leak in the house, that trustee has to be able to drop everything they, they're doing and go handle that. And so, you know, when we're having a discussion of who should be the trustee, that's where we sometimes get into the idea of a corporate trustee or a bank or trust company because they offer those services and oftentimes make better trustees than individuals because they're licensed, they're bonded, they're insured, and they do this every day. They manage trusts, they handle them, they do the things that they should do to, to deal with those things. They have three plumbers on their list of people to call if I've got a house problem in one of my trusts. And so they're used to having to do those type of things. They're used to reading wills and following the terms of wills. They have teams of people who deal with real estate and other things. So oftentimes corporate trustees make a lot of sense when we are setting up trusts for folks. And we talk to people about that. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they prefer a family member or an individual. And that's fine. Um, but that's their choice. And then, and then finally, when people are actually setting up a trust, one of the questions we get is, well, what, what actually sets up a trust? How does it happen? Well, when we're doing that, we can do it one of two ways. We can either do the trust under a will, where we do the trust terms and the rest in a will, and then that trust comes into being at death, or we can do what we call a lifetime trust or a living trust, where we set the trust up right now, here today, and we start to fund it with assets. And, and as you can see from the screen, when we do that, when we're setting up a trust right now, we are setting up, there, there are different types of trust that can be set up. One being a, what we call a revocable trust, which is you know, a lifetime and a fully amendable trust. Sometimes they're referred to as living trusts because they kind of, they go right along with you and they live with you until you pass away. And then when you die or become incapacitated, this revocable trust that you've set up during life that you put all your assets into becomes irrevocable. Now, and the difference in the two, revocable means it can be amended at any time. You can change it. You can do anything you want with it. Irrevocable means that it's become permanent, that there's no changing that trust. It's out there for good. Nothing's going to change it. And as you can see, there are a lot of different types of irrevocable trust that people set up. That trust under the will, like we talked about. You can do trust planning where it doesn't come into existence until the day you die. That's, that's an irrevocable trust created under will. Some people set up a gifting trust right now where they say, you know what, I want to give $10,000 or $20,000 to my grandkids. I want to put that in trust for their education. And I want to keep making gifts to that on an annual or, or lifetime basis. And so I want to set up a permanent trust to do that. And I want to name a trustee to handle that. Um, and again, we talked about a revocable trust becomes irrevocable 
after somebody becomes incapacitated or dies. And then there are things called UGMA or Uniform Gifts to Minor Trust that people can set up that will exist until the child turns 21 and then it'll pay it out to that child. Or we can do charitable trust planning. Some people like to leave trusts for churches or their favorite charity, whether it be the Red Cross, the Boy Scouts, something like that. And they want to leave some sort of charitable trust that pays people over time. And so I guess at this point, I'm going to take a quick break because I know a lot of times they want to ask questions. And so uh, I'll give people the opportunity to jump in and ask me some questions now since I've, I've been prattling on for a bit. So absolutely. Thank you, uh, Attorney Donsbach. You read my mind. I was just going to ask you that. So I think Ms. Thomas, Keyshawn Thomas it, uh, has the questions that are in the chat. I think there are a couple of, and they are going to handle those now. Keyshawn. Okay. okay, John. I have one question from one of our viewers. And the question is, what do you say to people who don't think they have enough assets to justify having a will? I think they're making a mistake, uh, to be honest, because even, even the most basic plan, I mean, in, in the scheme of life, wills are, yeah, I get that people don't want to pay for them. They don't want to go to an attorney and, and do that because there's a cost to doing it. Totally understand that. But the problem is, is that without a will, the state of Georgia has set a code section that determines who gets your property. And it may not be the way you want it to go. And, uh, you know, even if you own something as simple as a car, a bank account, a house, any of those items, as we talked about, the will controls those. And so if you have a bank account and you have a house and a car, which most people do, then I would tell you that's what you need to, you need a, you need a will at a minimum. And, and one of the slides that we'll talk later in this, at a minimum, people need to have a will, a power of attorney, and a healthcare directive to handle their affairs. Because without those three documents, you can run into situations where, let's say you have a car accident and you're in a coma or incapacitated. Who's gonna pay your phone and cable bill? It's not gonna be you anymore. And so the question that, that those documents answer is who you've put in charge to do that. And the same is true with a will. If you pass away, who's gonna handle your car your home, your bank account to make sure it gets to the right people and goes to the right parties. The will helps lay that out. It says, I'm going to name John Smith as my executor, and they're going to make sure that those things, that this car goes to my son, Timmy, and my bank account goes to my wife, or I'm going to make sure that the whole estate goes to my wife rather than be shared with my kids. Because if you oh. don't do a will, the spouse is going to have to share the estate with the kids. And that is not a good situation for a lot of people. Okay. So that uh, does that does that answer the will? Yes, I do have another question. We have okay. two more questions. Um, can you set up a trust after death of an individual? Well, yes, that's and that's and that's what we talked about. But their will has to do it. That's that's the only way you can do it is create a trust under a will. So it inst for instance, if I, 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 and I have a situation just like that myself, I have a trust because I have two minor children who are 17 and 15 who have determined that I am not very smart anymore because they are both teenagers. And that's a, that's a different issue. As we all know, teenagers are sure that their parents know nothing. So I have, because of that, created a trust in my will that comes, if something happens to both my wife and I, that it will set up a trust after my death for my kids until they reach a certain age. And so if you have kids in that age, absolutely, you want to consider setting up a trust in your will, or you can even do what we call the revocable trust and set that trust up during your lifetime. And then at your death, it becomes irrevocable. But you cannot set up a trust, a third party cannot set up for a trust for somebody after they die unless that party specifically created it in a document during their lifetime. Now, because okay. no, at that point, it's just an estate that it runs through what we call an administration of an estate if they don't have a will or trust document set up. And the intestacy rules of Georgia will take over and distribute the assets. Okay. Our next question, they want clarification. You establish a will and then establish a trust to identify how those things are managed, correct? 
Yes. And, and there are two ways. Again, there are two different paths you can go on when you're dealing with a trust, either under a will or a revocable trust. If you have a trust that you created under your will, what will happen is that trust will come into existence at your death. The will will name who the trustee is. The executor of the will will make be responsible for getting all the assets or marshalling or collecting all the assets of the estate and putting them in the trust or handing them over to the trustee. The other way you can go is what we call a revocable trust with a pour over will. And that is you set up the trust during your lifetime. You transfer all of the assets into that trust during your lifetime, car title, bank accounts, retirement plan beneficiaries, life insurance, real estate deeded to the trust. And you create that trust. And then the will, what it does is if you die and you forgot to put an asset in that trust, it says, hey, put that asset in that trust that I created during my lifetime. Otherwise, just look to that trust I created during my lifetime to determine what to do with my assets because they're all already there. So those are the two paths that you can pick when choosing to set up a trust or create a trust that you were trying to work with. Either do it during lifetime or it happens under your will. Okay. Now, once you get a living trust notarized, do you need to establish a trust account at a bank? And does the trust need to be recorded? Uh, trusts in Georgia do not need to be recorded. There's no requirement that they be recorded. Now, what you may have to do on the real estate records is you, you an attorney doing a title search or something may need what we call a certification of trust that it's in existence. And it's a document. It's a little short one or two page document that you can file instead of the whole trust document in the real estate records to prove that the trust is in existence and that yes, it can hold title to real estate. And so you'll probably need to have that certificate along with the deed that you file so that you can prove the trust is in existence that gets filed in the real estate records, but not the trust itself. And yes, you would need to open a bank account because if you want that trust to help you avoid probate and not go through the probate process, you have to fund the trust. And that's a common mistake we see made is people fail to fully fund their trust. They don't put the cars in it. They don't put the bank accounts in it. They don't title houses and deeds to the trust. And then we end up having to go through probate and either follow a will that doesn't put it in the trust or we have to probate it and put it in the trust because that's the process. So yes, if you okay. are doing revocable trust planning during lifetime, you need to have it all titled into the trust. And one last question before we move to the next session. Under an irrevocable trust, you cannot update or make changes to it once it's created. That is, that is and, and I'm going to give you the typical attorney answer. It depends. Uh, the irrevocable trust, that is correct. It is considered irrevocable and you can't amend it. However, the one caveat to that is I can petition a court as an attorney. I can file a petition with the superior court and ask to amend or change a trust based on certain conditions that might exist. I can, I can make an argument that the trust is, is not earning enough money and it needs to be distributed because the administrative costs are eating it. I could make an argument that the world has changed in such a, such a fashion, like the rules, the IRS rules changed or something changed, that when the settlor or the person who created the trust didn't know that these new rules would be in place, so maybe we should amend the trust for that reason. Sometimes even beneficiaries can file that with a court and ask a judge to amend a trust, but you have to go through a legal process to do it. And so, yes, the trust is irrevocable and can't be changed unless somebody actually stands in front of a court and says, judge, here are the reasons we think you should undo or change this trust. And then the court decides whether they should or shouldn't based on all those factors. So, now, John, when you say fund the trust, what exactly does that mean? What that means is retitling assets into the trust name. So for instance, if I set up a revocable trust, if I set up the John Donsbach Living Trust or Revocable Trust, then that, and that's it's probably my next slide is steps to make the trust work, I think actually uh, is, is what that is. And, and that's exactly what that is. Uh, it, might, it might actually, it's a little farther down. We're going to get to that. 
But, okay, so we can hold for that one. Yeah, we're, we're going to get to that of what it takes to title the assets and how the trust works. And that's what's called funding a trust. Okay, so we will get to that anonymous uh, question asker. So I will turn it back over to Brenda so we can continue the presentation. Hey, Sean, right. there are some questions that are in the chat and we're asking people, uh, I don't know if you've seen those there, but there, if you have a question, if you would type that question in the Q&A as opposed to the chat area so that uh, Keyshawn is administering the Q&A, she can see those questions in the Q&A portion. If you have that on the bottom of your screen, please. Okay. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead to the next. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think my next slide is when to use revocable trusts. And, and kind of what makes sense and why we use these trusts, right? You know, and, and, and really think of it this way. There, there are two paths to go. You either are doing a revocable trust or you're doing a will. Those are really the two planning documents that you're putting in play. You need one or the other. And so a lot of times using a revocable trust makes sense. If, if clients come to me and they say, I want to avoid probate. I don't want my estate to go through the probate court. I don't want to do any of this. Okay. Well, then we'll, we'll set up a revocable trust. And, and as we just kind of talked about a little bit briefly, the one thing we need to do is fund it. We need to make sure we get all the assets transferred into it. Everything's there, retitled into the trust, and that will make it work, so to speak. And so that's one time we need it. Sometimes we've got, like, for instance, if you lived in South Carolina, uh, we're here in Augusta, so we're on the border and we do a lot of planning in South Carolina as well. The probate process in South Carolina is horrendous and it is very expensive. They charge you a percentage of your estate value as the probate court costs. So, you know, even on a million dollar estate, it's $2,000 in charges in probate court fees. And so you can see very quickly, it makes sense to do revocable trust planning to avoid the probate process in South Carolina. Now in Georgia, that's not true. Georgia's probate process is cheap. It's a, you know, basically a $300 filing fee to file in with the probate court. And if the documents are set up correctly and done, it's, it's a quick process and it's not, it's not a big deal. And so not, not a, not a problem at all. Some people used to do rev trust to avoid what we call the spousal right or your support petition, but that's long since been kind of dealt with in Georgia. And it's clear that that's not something you can do anymore as of 2010. Uh, and then finally, you know, if you've got, if you've got health concerns, maybe Parkinson's, or you've been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's or onset with some sort of mental concerns or physical concerns, then setting up a revocable trust helps because it will put a trustee to be able to step in immediately if you become incapacitated or, or do pass away, who can handle those assets right away, either for your benefit or to make sure they go to your heirs. So in those instances, revocable trust makes some sense. And then finally, sometimes people like them for estate challenges. They're worried about, uh, you know, a, a child born out of wedlock or a child from a previous relationship challenging it or, a, you know, former, any number of issues like that. And so they want to put it in a rev trust, which isn't publicly filed with the probate court so that it can, it can be dealt with. And that's, that's another difference that's important between rev trust and wills. Wills are actually filed with the probate court in a public record whereas revocable trusts are not. Um, and, and so, you know, the, now beneficiaries will get copies of revocable trust when they become irrevocable under Georgia law, because within 60 days of a trust becoming irrevocable and somebody being the beneficiary of it, you have to notify them that they're a beneficiary. So, you know, we don't run into those type of problems. Um, but, you know, and, and the next, as I said, my next slide kind of gets in, that, that's what to use them. And then we're talking about sometimes you use them to avoid guardianship and conservatorship. Uh, sometimes that's done with joint asset planning, with joint accounts or other things like that. But rev trusts are a great way to do that. Uh, another set of documents that will also help with guardianships and conservatorships are powers of attorney and healthcare directives. So if you don't have a rev trust, you certainly need to have those. And even if you do have a rev trust, I would tell everyone they need a power of attorney and healthcare directive. But those are kind of some of the documents and things that need to be considered relative to avoiding a guardianship or conservatorship, because you certainly don't want to have to go to a guardianship or conservatorship for a 15-year-old child 
because now I've got to go get a bond, which I've got to go pay an insurance company to get bonded. I've got to report to the probate court until they turn 18 every year. And I've got to file assets with that court. So trust planning is critically important when you have minor children because the cost of handling their assets is really expensive if you don't have trust planning in place. And that's true of grandchildren too. If you want to leave things to grandkids who are minors, same issue. You know, you want to be careful with that and make sure that you've done some sort of trust planning so it doesn't end up in a conservatorship or guardianship. Um, and then on the next, estate documents when I do the revocable trust. Well, this is what you should have. If you do the revocable trust, you should have two documents. You should have what we call a pour over will, which is a will that says, hey, if I forgot to put an asset in this trust, if I forgot to retitle all my assets to this trust, I want you to pour those over into this trust or put them in this trust after my death. Now, that means you will still have to probate because you'll have to go through probate to retitle those assets to that trust you created. But it's, it's, it's a necessary document if you've done Rev Trust Planning to make sure that everything's set up correctly. And then of course, you need the revocable trust itself, which is the document that says what happens to how all the assets are distributed. Do they continue in trust for people? What ages do they get distributed? How does it get distributed? All those things. Uh, and, and that's and that's what the Rev Trust does. It doesn't it doesn't have to last in perpetuity or forever, as somebody might say. You can set the ages and when things are detailed or distributed out. And under Georgia law, our law says that trusts cannot last for more than 360 years from the date of creation of the rest. Now, obviously, nobody's had a trust last that long because our country hasn't been in existence that long. But so trust can last up to that length of time under Georgia law, but most of the trusts distribute long before that because they say they have the provisions in them that distribute and tell you when it distributes or what age people get it or how it's distributed. And sometimes it's in percentages, sometimes it's amounts, sometimes it says they can distribute income and principal or all sorts of things. There's a lot of flexibility in drafting the trust as far as what it actually says and what can be done. And that's, and that's what the planner does. That's what somebody like me does, the estate planner. They help you walk through what you can do and how you can do it and structure it the way you want to. And so I, and I think the next slide is going to get to where we were uh, before, which was steps to make the trust work. Um, which was what I think somebody asked before, do I have to retitle things in? The answer to that's yes. You need to make sure that those items are titled in the name of the trustee of the trust. So for instance, if I set up the John Donsbach revocable trust and I was the trustee of my own revocable trust, which I can be, or my wife was the trustee, let's say I set the trust up and, and, and name my wife as my trustee, then what would have to happen is my car title, I would have to go down to the DMV, I would have to fill out the car title, name it to my wife as trustee of my revocable trust, and that would transfer it into the trust. I'd have to do the same thing with my deeds, any real estate or deeds I'd own. I'd have to prepare a deed, name it to my wife as trustee of the trust, and then it would get and file it in the real estate records and it'd get transferred in the trust. Bank accounts, I have to go to my bank and name them in the name of the trust and put the trustee on the bank account. Life insurance beneficiary forms, IRAs, I would have to name the beneficiary as the trustee of the trust. So yes, there are steps that you need to take. Just drafting the document, and, and this is the mistake we see a lot of people make. And we see people make this mistake who've gone to attorneys who have drafted a trust document and they don't fund it. They don't put the assets in the trust. And that is a big mistake because then it doesn't work. And now these assets go through whatever your will says. So if you didn't put them in the trust, your will will control what happens to them. Now, if you did proper revocable trust planning and you have that quote, pour over will, it's just going to say, put them all in the trust. But we've had situations where people drafted a trust didn't fund it, and then had a will that had different provisions in it than the trust did. And guess what happened? The trust didn't do anything. The will controlled those assets because they weren't titled in the trust at death. And so it's critically important that you coordinate 
those assets with any trust planning you're doing. And the same holds true for planning under a will. The mistake that we see with trust planning under a will, people set up this great trust under the will for their kids, but then guess what they do with their life insurance and 401k beneficiaries? They don't title them or name them to that trust. They name the spouse and the kids. And so that trust doesn't end up controlling those proceeds of either the policy or the 401k benefits. And that is a huge mistake to make if you've got those assets that you want controlled by that trust. So it's, it's important to go to somebody who, A, asks you all the questions about what do you have, but B, who understands how this process works and helps you coordinate setting all of it up to make sure it's done. Because there's no such thing as just a little revocable trust online kit, you fill it out and you're done. As you can see, there's more to that process than just filling out the document. And that's why it's really important to make sure that these things are done correctly. Now, on the next slide, that's, that's where we get to I, I get this question. Okay, I put it all in my trust. I created this trust, and now I want to now I want to amend it. Well, that's that's what my next slide kind of talks about, which is, hey, you can do that. It's really very easy, and that's and that's the 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 benefit to a revocable trust. You can amend them at any time so long as you're competent. And you know there and there there's certain ways to do it. You just amend it in writing. Or you can, and then you do an amendment document to that trust, or you restate the trust in its entirety. Now, I'll tell you what my preference is. My preference is when you're amending a trust is to restate it completely and redo the whole trust with the new provisions. For this reason, we have seen people who did not like the amendment that was done to the trust that was done in a separate document, and they have simply just thrown it away and said, we don't know what amendment you're talking about. We couldn't find one. And so I would tell you that if you're going to amend a revocable trust or redo it, that you certainly want to, I believe, restate the whole trust so that the trust is contained in one document rather than having multiple amendments and documents. I mean, we've had rev trust that we've gotten and there were six amendments to the documents and we had to have six or seven different documents and we were reading back to provision eight to try to figure out how it was amended three times. And it's just a lot easier to just restate the document in its entirety. And again, if you are amending that document, you need to be careful that you also coordinate and restate your beneficiary forms because there's nothing worse in the world than having a beneficiary form or life insurance policy point to your 2020 trust that you drafted when you redid it in 2023. And now there's some confusion as, as which trust applies and did you mean for it to go to the 2020 trust or the 2023 trust? Or So again, I would just say anybody who's making these type of amendments or changes, just make sure that whoever you're working with can, can work through these things and help make it work for you. And then, you know, finally, uh, there's some some alternatives to revocable trust, which uh, is a couple slides later uh, in this that's that's after the one we just talked about. And it's what I call my alternative to revocable trust planning with real estate. And that's that can be done with LLCs. And you can use the LLC instead of a revocable trust to avoid probate in other jurisdictions, provide liability protection, and it, and it helps avoid the complexity sometimes of managing a revocable trust during your lifetime. And, and sometimes it's a good vehicle to use instead of a revocable trust is to just set up a LLC if you've got real estate. But I bet there's some questions out there, so I'm gonna, gonna yeah. pause for a moment so somebody can ask those. Okay, John, here we go. At the end of the day, what is the motivating factor to have a trust versus a will that describes in detail how to how assets should be split. I, I would say the motivating factor should be what do you want to do with them? What do you want to have happen with your assets? Do you want the state of Georgia to tell you they get to go to your spouse and kids in a certain percentage? Or do you want to have control over that? Do you want to have control over whether or not your wife gets the house or not, or whether she gets all the assets rather than some of them? 
Do you want your kids to get them at certain ages? Do you want grandkids to get some of the stuff instead of the kids? I mean, those are those should all be motivating factors. The, the motivating factor should be, I want my estate plan to go exactly the way I want it to go. That should be everybody's motivating factor. And, and if it's not, that's fine. I mean, if you're not, if you, if you feel comfortable with letting the state of Georgia decide how your assets are transferred to and among family or relatives, then you don't need a will or you don't need a trust. And, and you're absolutely right. But I, I can tell you in 25 years of practice, I've never had somebody sit in my office and go, yeah, it's okay. I, I, the state of Georgia deciding how my assets go, I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> that has never been the answer. So I, I would tell you that should be at a minimum the motivating factor. Uh, to make sure that your plan is transferred the way you want it. Okay. Our next question. Um, if a person has been designated as a trustee in a will over a handicapped person and the handicapped person dies, can the handicapped person's heirs sell the handicapped person's interest without the trustee's approval? No. That trust document should say what happens to the trust, what we call corpus or principle that's remaining in that trust when that person passes away. If it doesn't, then you have to go to the court and ask the court what to do with that trust and how it should be distributed because it doesn't have a proper residue or termination clause. So no, the, the trust itself should determine where those assets go. And if it doesn't, you need to go to a court to seek approval on how to distribute that. Okay, our next question. If you create a trust, does the IRS look at the trust as a new entity for tax filing purposes, i.e., does a trust file taxes each year to the IRS? Uh, yes and no. And, and, and here's the answer. If it's an irrevocable trust, yes, it is a separate entity. It gets its own tax ID number. It files what we call a 1041 income tax return every year, and it is treated as a separate entity all by itself. A revocable trust does not. A revocable trust, until the person dies who set it up, stays revocable. It uses that person's social security number for purposes of trust identification throughout the entire lifetime of that individual. And then when that individual dies, the revocable trust becomes irrevocable, becomes its own separate entity, and has to go get its own tax ID number at that point. So... The answer to that question is yes and no. Uh, depending on the type of trust you have, it, it, it affects that answer. Okay. If you how is property handled by the mortgage company? Um, if when you when the owner passes and you have a living trust. Typically, the trustee who is the successor trustee in the document has the right to deal with the bank because the, the property's been titled in the trust and it can be dealt with by the trustee, they would have the right to go talk to the bank and deal with the mortgage and or pay it off. Sometimes the mortgage companies are sticklers and they require an executor, i.e. a probate, to be appointed so they can deal with the personal representative or executor of the estate. But typically the trustee of the trust can pay it off or contact the mortgage company if it was deeded into the trust to deal with it. Okay. Is it recommended to set up a primary and alternate grantor in a trust? Uh, well, th there's really, there's only one grantor of a trust. It's the person who set it up. And sometimes it can be multiple people. In other words, you can have co-grantors or dual settlers, like a husband and wife, typically. But typically you don't have a backup grantor. Now you can have backup trustees and you absolutely should have backup trustees. Because when the primary trustee dies, you want to make sure, or isn't there or incapacitated, you want to make sure you have people named who will handle and manage the trust after that. So maybe there's a confusion in terms of the grantor or settlor is the person who creates the trust. The trustee is the person who manages and handles it moving forward. And you absolutely want to have successor trustees. Okay. What about a testamentary trust for my wife to keep her income coming? and not going to my kids at my death. Yeah, we see that a lot. There are a lot of people who maybe they have concerns about the wife being able to manage property or they have what we call a blended family. It's their second or third spouse and the kids are from a prior relationship and they wanna make sure that their wife or husband is taken care of if they pass away. 
then yes, absolutely, you should set up a trust under the will that puts those assets in trust for their benefit and pays them the income and, and name a trustee that you feel confident can handle that. Particularly if you've got a wife and the kids aren't her kids, name somebody who can handle a dispute between them and, and, and manage that because that could be a sticky situation. Okay, I have one more question. Do you have a ballpark price range to create a somewhat simple revocable trust? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you what we generally charge to do it. Usually they run about 1500 to 2500 to do. And what that includes is the pour over will, the revocable trust, and all of the draft, all the conference time, all the revisions, all the amendments, any changes to it, you know. Now, if we change the trust 47 times in revising it, it gets more expensive. And I have had people who wanted to go through 47 drafts of a document. But, you know, if we have the standard number of drafts or revisions, you know, once or twice or a few changes here after you get the draft documents, then, of course. And that also includes transferring assets, helping you transfer assets to the trust, car titles, bank accounts, naming beneficiary forms, and then, of course, a power of attorney and a health care directive. So yeah, that's the range that it usually costs to do that type of planning. And, and as we said before, sometimes that's not necessary. Sometimes you can do the same type of planning under a will, which is cheaper because you don't have to transfer all the assets during lifetime into that trust. And so sometimes it's cheaper to do the will planning and the trust planning under the will and do it that way and allow it to go through the probate process. And, and that's the style of trust planning you want to do. Every estate is different. That's why you need to know what the assets are, what people have and what they want to do with it to be able to figure that out. Okay, and one last question. What happens to my business assets and bank accounts if not listed in my will when I die? Well, if your will has what we call a residue clause in it, which every will should have, that says all the rest residue and remainder of my estate goes to X. That means that anything you didn't specifically devise in the will falls under that clause and it goes to those people. So, your will may very well say where it goes and it goes to the residue. Now, if your will fails to have a residue clause, the state of Georgia has written one for you. And we have seen wills where that happens. And what that means is, is that they will go to your intestate heirs if there's no residue clause or specific device of them in the, in the will, which is that original slide we talked about, which is wife one third and then the kids. So... That's what happens if you don't have that residue clause. Okay. And at some point, we'd like more insight about land trusts. Okay. Yeah, land trusts are, Georgia doesn't really have a specific land trust statute necessarily. Some states do, like Illinois and certain Midwest farming states have what they call land trusts. But here... We, we have just trusts that can hold real estate. And so some people kind of call it a land trust. What I would say is it's just a trust that holds land that you've deeded land over to and you've set the terms within that trust as far as how you want it, that land to be distributed or handled and managed. So that's, that's what I would call a land trust under Georgia law. Okay. Um, Brenda, are you ready to go back to the PowerPoint? Yes, if that's all the questions, we're good. We'll let him finish the other slides and then hold the remaining questions toward the end. So okay. I'll you to type your questions, but please put them in the Q&A section on uh, not the chat section, but the Q&A section. Thank you. Okay. And, Is it and, the slides you want to pick up on? Uh, we, we can move one more down. Okay. Here. And that, this was the LLC slide that I finished on. So we can go one more past this. Okay. Which is, and, and this is actually one of the questions I think somebody had is when should the marital share not be distributed outright to my spouse is, is when I want to do income. And, and these are, these are some of the times it makes sense to set up trust for the spouse. Maybe they're, the spouse doesn't handle or manage money very well. Uh, maybe the children will try to take advantage of the spouse. They'll whisper in mama or dad's ear to try to get to the assets. Maybe we have children from a different relationship or previous marriage. Then we certainly want to consider trust planning. Uh, and, and I've got a second wife or, or husband with no children. 
then maybe again, I want to do some trust planning. So if you have any of those situations that come up, trust planning makes a lot of sense for people under the wills. And it's a great vehicle for protection for that. So I would encourage you to consider that if you are doing that. Um, and then the next, the next slide that we will go to is problems with joint planning. You know, a lot of people will say, ah, I don't need a will. I don't need a trust. It's no big deal. I'll just, I'll just put my kids on the accounts and everything will work out great. Well, if you do have a taxable estate, joint planning or joint bank accounts that transfer under survivorship rules automatically on death can be a problem because you can do in your tax planning. Um, if you put your child on your bank account, it means that that child is the person who receives the account and the other kids will get nothing and the will and or trust will not control. This is a huge mistake that we see people make all of the time. They put their child on the account because little Timmy always helped them with the paying the bills and he's a good son and he's going to do it right and he's going to take care of mama and lo and behold when mama dies little Timmy's on the account and he does not share it with his brother Doug and his sister Sally because mom loved him that much and legally it is his by law because it was a survivorship account. It is a big mistake people make a lot and one we would like to see people make less because as you can imagine, it creates hard feelings and lawsuits and emotional problems. The other problem is sometimes naming a child on a big stock account or something is treated as a gift because as soon as you name a person jointly on an account with you, they can access that account. They have the right to use it. It's, it's, they can use it just like you can. And to that point, that last point there creates a major problem. We have had a situation where Dad put his son on the account. Well, what dad didn't know is the son had a bunch of IRS problems and IRS liens, and the IRS came in and levied the joint account because the son was on it. So by putting kids on your accounts or putting other people on your accounts, you are opening them up to the creditors that they may have, which could be a really bad result and something you don't want to have happen. So... Again, this is why revocable trust planning or good planning makes sense with assets rather than just saying, I'm going to go the quickie way and do some joint planning. Now, there are times to do joint planning with assets, particularly among spouses. Joint bank accounts help us avoid probate. Joint designations on real estate with survivorship help us avoid probate. So those are good things. But again, it's a case-by-case -case basis to determine that. And, you know, this is the other thing we get into. How hard is a beneficiary designation? You know, I just name my wife and the kids as contingent. Or I put a trust under the will and I, I, I name that. It's easy. I don't, I don't have to worry about that. Well, the next slide shows you some of the problems that can happen with that. And, and when you do that, you know, Fred names Wilma, then the kids as beneficiaries on insurance retirement plan. Well, she gets a rollover. That's great. And the kids as beneficiaries over 18 now might have to distribute that over a 10-year period with Roth plans as well. So when you've got retirement plans and 401k plans and you're doing trust planning, you absolutely need to see somebody who knows what they're doing with these income tax rules. Because as you can see, the ones in red can create real problems you know, if you don't do it right. Because if you've got young kids, you get special rules that apply to them and you don't have to pay as much money out and you can save income tax. But if you do it wrong, that doesn't work. Uh, you can also have things that, that happen if you've got beneficiary forms, you don't want to name minor kids directly because then I've got to go get conservatorships and guardianships for them to handle the money. And that's a bad, bad situation. Um and then again, if you've got certain planning or, or goals, you want to coordinate those with your tax planning and trust planning to make sure it works right. So just naming them is great, but it may have some unintended consequences that you want to talk about with somebody before you do that. And then, you know, finally, that, that's the, that's the kind of discussion here, which was the one right before, which is the trust planning. For life insurance, it's not really a problem. But the 401ks and the others have tax consequences associated with them. It's it's the yeah, that's the one. 
And you can you can have to structure trust in a certain way as either a conduit trust or an accumulation trust to make the 401k and IRA beneficiaries work properly under the tax laws. And so not to get into a lot of detail on that, if you have a 401k or IRA and you're doing trust planning, see a tax trust estate planner who knows what they're doing with those assets because they have certain income tax rules that apply to them that you can really create problems with if you don't follow. So do make sure you see good people on that. And then finally, as we talked about before, the, the other documents you need to consider and have financial powers of attorney that allow you to make gifts or do gifting to people, durable healthcare powers that name healthcare agents to, to help you. And you may want to consider long-term care insurance because we have seen situations where that really preserves the estate. If you have long-term care insurance and someone has to go into a nursing home or need care, then it's great to have that policy because it helps protect them and protect their assets. Now, the next part that I get asked a lot, which is the next slide, is the difference in a revocable trust versus will. And what's that difference? And how does that, how does that really work? Well, revocable trusts, they help you avoid probate if they're properly funded and they're a better vehicle oftentimes for incapacity issues because the trustee can step in right away and start managing your assets rather than having to use your POA document to go chase things and do that. You quickly get a successor trustee in place to manage and handle assets and they're right there when something bad happens. They're not filed with the probate court or made publicly available so people don't really know what your planning is. Some of the negatives are they're harder to administer. For them to work properly, you've got to retitle all those assets into them. If you go buy a new car, you got to make sure the car's in there. you got to get your bank accounts in there. you got to get beneficiary forms titled to them. And, of course, if you don't fund them properly, you still have to go to probate. So those are, those are some of the pros and cons of the revocable trust versus a will. On the, flip, on the next screen, it kind of talks about some of the, the positives of a will, and some of the disadvantages of the will relative to this, which are, you know, the will has to go through probate. So that means I've got to publicly file my last wishes. And sometimes people don't like that. Sometimes they are simpler to administer than a trust because I don't have to pay any trust transfer costs or administration costs or deed transfer costs until I pass away. And so, you know, if I've just got a car and a bank account and a house, well, a will may be the right answer versus a rev trust. Uh, it does take a little bit longer to get an executor and trustee appointed in a will context because you've got to wait for the probate court to probate the will and get the will proven. The public, they're publicly available. I can go get anybody's will that's filed after death in the probate court. And, you know, wills don't always handle incapacity as well as revocable trusts. But again, as you can see, a rev trust or a will is not a one size or one shoe fits all. It's a case by case basis in each estate in talking with a planner, what makes the most sense for me? And that's that's what should be happening. Do I need a will? Do I need a trust? And that's and that's why it should be done. Um, and then finally, these are the general processes. This, this kind of gives you a feel for the probate process. If you have a will and what can happen uh, is you know, you've got to file the petition and you've got to have the original will to file it in the probate court. And then the executor has to get an appointment hearing with the probate judge to go get sworn in and raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm going to handle this estate. Then you've got to notify all the heirs that the probate's happening. You've got to notify creditors with a publication. And then after creditor periods are resolved, you can start distributing the estate. And I think I misspelled distribute there. It's missing an I. But, but that's, you know, but in Georgia, that's a fairly quick process. It's usually a three-week process or four-week process in most probate courts to get an executor appointed. So you're only talking about a three- or four-week delay. So, but sometimes that can matter to people, and that's where the Rev Trust may make some more sense than the probate process. But again, probate's cheaper, and it's not as expensive, so... Sometimes going through this probate process makes perfect sense because you end up paying more for the for the rev for the rev trust than you would the will going through probate. And here's why you want to do a will. I think I was asked that question. What motivates you? 
Well, this is what should motivate anybody to either do a will or a revocable trust. The assets are going to go where you want them. I, you don't have unintended beneficiaries. You don't get unintended people owning things. You don't have weird ownership with a wife or kids. You know, you don't have, if you have a predeceased child, you don't have grandkids doing anything weird, you know, getting property in an order you don't want. You know, real estate ends up getting owned by the right parties. We don't end up oftentimes with what we call heirs property when we have a will or rev trust because we've designated who gets the property and the real estate. And so I don't end up with 46 cousins owning the property together. And then, you know, if you've got a will, order of death won't matter in owning real estate because the will will devise it to who it should go to. And, and that can affect, that can be affected when you don't have a will or revocable trust. So those are all reasons to do those documents. And then the real important question, which I think is probably our last topic, is what who should be my trustee or administrator? Who should do this? Who should handle this for me? Well, I can tell you who shouldn't do it. And these are the people I would tell you shouldn't do it. Typically, your caretaker is not the right person because a lot of times they're doing it for the wrong reasons. We've had third-party caretakers come in and try to get wills drafted for people or estates to try to make it themselves as the beneficiaries. Not a good situation. Irresponsible children or family members. I've had clients sit down with me and say, oh, little Timmy's going to be a great trustee. He should handle it. Well, let's talk about little Timmy. And you start asking the questions. Well, how does he handle money? Oh, well, he's been in bankruptcy three times. Well, okay. What about other things? Well, he's got two tax liens with the IRS because he hadn't paid his taxes. Well, that's not a good person to name as your trustee who's going to financially manage or handle your estate or your trust. Uh, third parties that befriend people, they're often doing it for the wrong reason. That goes back to the caretaker or, or the folks that we've seen try to come in and take estates. And then, of course, people who have poor financial judgment are very, very poor choices because trustees are important. They're going to have to know how to manage real estate, how to pay bills, how to make good investment decisions, how to follow the trust terms and invest money so that it earns income and makes money for people if you've got beneficiaries or kids who need to live off the trust if something happens. So I would tell you those are the people that should be your designated people are responsible parties, parties who have good decision making that can understand finance and, and make the right decision for you or your beneficiaries. And then the next slide kind of shows you some of the things that we've seen happen in bad trust situations when you name the wrong person. You know, they, they transfer bank accounts or fund designations or move things improperly or effectively just steal the money. We've had people change beneficiaries on insurance or retirement plans to themselves or other people that they shouldn't have when we've got the wrong people. And then, or they sell assets for the gain of the agent because they're going to get some sort of commission or benefit out of it. Or they transfer car titles and real estate because they get a benefit. Again, these are all abuses that can be avoided by naming the right person and having the right person in charge. And then if, if we jump two slides down, what happens when we have those breaches or those bad things happen? Well, when a fiduciary breaches it, yeah, you're right. You can sue them and you can go after them. But that's absolutely part of the problem. The breaches typically aren't discovered until after death where we had a power of attorney who was misbehaving or we had a trustee who was misbehaving and we've learned that the assets suddenly aren't there or were supposed to be there. You know, and then we get into fight. Let's say we named a sibling as a fiduciary. Well, sometimes they fight with each other and they create breach of fiduciary duty disputes and then sue each other. And that's a mess. Then we have to file for things like a breach of duty, fiduciary duty action or an accounting in the Superior Probate Court to go find the assets. They are time consuming, expensive, and oftentimes we have to file third party discovery with banks to go get bank statements and financial information because people did bad things with them. This is why it's important to name a good administrator or a good trustee or a good fiduciary 
because you absolutely want to avoid all of those type of claims and why that person is an important person. And then finally, my last, I guess the thing to leave with you, my last slide before, before a little bit of humor, is these are the reasons to do these documents. All of these reasons, peace of mind, cost savings for fights and administrative problems. You'll have a full and efficient administration of the assets. They'll go to the right people. Proper management of assets. Trust may be necessary to create income for kids or spouses or manage the assets and invest them properly for those kids so they have an income stream and go to college. They can pay for their rent or whatever else is necessary when they need that. Um, and then just frankly, for your own peace of mind and self-benefit, it ensures that your wishes are carried out and handled the way you want them. And it reduces any kind of family friction or other things that might happen. And, you know, don't be like this last slide that I have. This is the one where we see the most often, this is the type of person we usually have come to our office is, and, and they're, they're, they're really sick or they're on their deathbed and they go, I need an estate plan right now tomorrow. Or the spouse comes to me and says, my wife is now no, is, is incapacitated. I need to do a will. Well, at that point, it's too late. And I, I would tell you, don't be Mr. Frosty when it's spring and, and you're melting and it's time to do it. Do it at a time where you're not pressured, where you're not under duress, where you can take the time with the advisor and the planner to sit down and walk through it and really think through what you want to do because you're not going to make as good a decision when the sun is melting you and you got to get it done. So with that, I, I kind of, I would, I would wrap that up today and, and just take any questions at this point with any, anybody else with whoever's got any more questions or comments and I'll answer as many as, as need be. Okay. Well, let's get started then. Let's see. I have a will, a durable power of attorney and a living will. I have a son with special needs and he has a special needs trust. My other son has a trust also. I own a small business. I also have an umbrella policy. Is there anything else that I need? Well, no. I mean, it sounds like you've got a really good foundation in your plan. Um, and, I, you know, without seeing the actual documents and how they're drafted, but it sounds like you went to somebody who drafted some good documents for you and put some good things in place. Now, whether they're exactly what works and what should work, I, I can't see without seeing the actual documents. But it, it sounds like based on what you're saying, you have the documents you need for your situation, which is great. You're, you're in the minority. Most people don't who, who have the situation you have have not gone to the detailed planning that you have. Uh, and But it sounds like you've got a really good start without seeing the documents. Okay. The next question is, are trust immediately affected? Uh Yes, trusts are immediately effective, whether they're revocable or irrevocable upon signing. Uh, it's just a function of what's in them. You know, did you fund them? And that's and that's true of the irrevocable or or revocable. The revocable trust is effective immediately. The question is, what does it control? Did you retitle the deeds and the house and the stuff into it to control it or not? An irrevocable trust, did you set up a gifting trust and actually put the $10,000 in it? Uh, and what does it control? But yeah, they're... they're they're effective immediately, but it's still a function of, did you title assets into them that will control them and, and, and control that trust and be controlled by that trust? So it's a two-step process. Sign the document, put the assets in it. That's, okay. that's what makes it effective. Okay. How does placing real estate in a trust after tax credits on that, affect tax credits on that property? Does placing a home in a trust, make the trust the owner, or are you still recognized as the owner? If it is a revocable trust, you are still treated as the owner. If it is an irrevocable trust, you are not treated as the owner, and it can impact certain tax benefits like homestead exemptions and other things. Now, there are rules if an irrevocable trust owns a homestead that you can still get the homestead exemption as long as the beneficiary is living in the house. So like if a wife has a trust set up for her benefit under a will from a husband, they don't lose their homestead exemption just because it went into that irrevocable trust. But yeah, there are some tax credits and credits that can be impacted based upon 
whether it's irrevocable or revocable trust. And so those are important to know and talk with your advisor about what's going on if that's a concern. Okay. How do you title a property with a mortgage in a trust? Uh, well, you can transfer it to the trust. Now, there are what we call a due on sale clause in a lot of mortgages. Now, if it's a revocable trust, it will not trip typically the due on sale clause because the revocable trust, you are still treated as an owner and creditors under Georgia law can still invade your revocable trust to get paid back. So you have not gotten away from creditors if it's a revocable trust. If it's an irrevocable trust, it may actually technically trigger the mortgage payment being due in full, pay in, paid in full immediately. And so you do want to be careful with mortgages on properties and transferring to trust that whoever's working with it understands and knows that those type of things can happen and just discuss it with them before you do it. Okay. In the sense of a farm, is it possible to put one big tract of land in a trust and split the other tracts up via a wheel? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Can you combine a will in one state to a trust in another state? Yes, yes. I can point a will in Georgia to a trust I create in another state. I can say, put this property in the Nevada trust I created. Now, it's not always good to do that. And usually the reasons we see that happen is where some parent or grandparent set up a gifting trust for a child or grandchild and somebody wants to add to, during the life of that grandparent and somebody wants to add to that trust. That's where we usually see a will designation to that type of trust. But usually your trust and will are created within the same state if they're done. Okay. Where is a trust document kept and by whom? I would tell you in a safe place. And, and I know that sounds kind of silly, but I would, if you've got a fireproof safe or a safety deposit box or somewhere else, your original should be kept there. Um, if you want to, now wills can actually be filed with the probate court. You can pay a $10 or $15 fee and publicly file your will prior to death with the probate court and have it on file so that probate court in your county where you live will have it. Trust you don't do that with. And so I would tell you, make sure your trustee, your successor trustee has a copy of it, knows it exists, knows what's going on, and that they know who the attorney was or who it was that drafted it so they could go back to them as well. Okay. If I have a trust under the wheel, what things do I need to do now to make things easier for my trustee after I die? Well, you're going to want to make sure that you've pointed your beneficiary forms to the trustee in the correct way, like life insurance and 401ks. You're going to want to make sure that trust has the special IRS magic language in it if you're going to do that so that it can handle those type of assets. Because if you don't have certain provisions in that trust, just naming that trust as a beneficiary of those could be a tax problem. And then in addition to that, you're going to want to make sure that whoever your trustee is knows what your asset listing is, knows where they are, where do you bank. Where, where, are the, where are the original car titles kept? Where are the original trailer titles kept? You know, what are your passwords to certain online bank accounts and banking and other things? Provide a password list to stuff. Um, you know, those type of things your trustee should probably have. Okay, well, back to the farm question. With one track being in a trust, and the, does the trustee have responsibility of making the decision? Do they have final say-so? Uh, over the... They have to follow the trust terms related to the trust, the track that's in the trust. They must follow the trust terms. And if they don't, they could be held accountable for breaching their fiduciary duty in not following the trust. But they have to do whatever the trust tells them to do with that track to land once the person dies or once certain triggers happen or whatever. Whatever the trust says to do with it, they have to do it. Okay. And I think you've answered this, but just to reiterate, on the revo revocable trust, can you have multiple trustees or list an alternate trustee? Or is it advisable to only list one if it's an individual rather than a corporate trustee? Uh, yes, you may have co-trustees or multiple trustees. I, I can tell you my experience with them is bad, that, that they often don't get along and in order for the trustees to act, they both have to agree to do something. So you create a, un unanim a unanimous type situation where one trustee can block 
the action of another with co-trustees. So it doesn't always lead to good situations with co. I, I'm a huge proponent of let's name one trustee after another. Let's name them in successive order. Let's name Tim, then Sally, then Susie, rather than co-trustees, because it avoids that exact problem. Okay. Let's see. Our next question is, um, someone has learned that their ex-spouse may receive their Social Security benefits after their divorce if they're married over 10 years. So their current spouse, they've been married less than three years, is listed on their will and as a trustee. Does the ex-spouse have any access and is probate needed? Okay, let me. There, there's some, there's some, something to unpack there. Let me see if I understand the question. Um, let me let me back up here. What was what was that question again? Oh boy, I gotta go back to the question. Let's see. Okay, so the question is. Let me scroll down. Do I find it? Oh, I think I lost the question. I think the person got remarried and they've been married less than three years and they wanted to see if that first person has access to their Social Security benefits. Well, there are certain rules, and, and admittedly, I always have to look this up. There are certain rules related to ex-spouses and divorce and Social Security benefits, depending on whether you started taking them and certain certain aspects of that. So, yeah, there are some issues related to that. Um, and, and I just I don't I don't have that answer off the top of my head. That's one that so in that case, would you would you recommend that that person speak to an attorney? Yeah, I would. I they, they need to sit down and talk to somebody. That's one that 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 requires unpacking the facts a little bit more than than in a three minute fifty thousand foot view. Okay. If I have a will, durable power of attorney, and live a will, I have a son with special needs, and he has a special needs trust. My other son has a trust also. I own a small business. I have an, oh, wait, I already answered this one. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If there's anything else that you need. Okay. Is there a ballpark of network of when to consider a trust versus a will? Um, I would tell people if you're going to leave a trust, and I'm not talking a revocable trust. If you're setting up a permanent irrevocable trust that's going to that's gonna have assets that are managed, the cost of administering it, I would tell people, you know, you want to you want to be in the three to five hundred thousand dollar range for that to make sense for that trust planning for that permanent long term trust planning to make sense. Now, a revocable trust is a little different because it's more of a probate avoidance technique, and it's it's being used to avoid the probate process potentially. So, setting up the rev trust is a different. It it, it can be just as simple as having a house, a bank account, and a car, uh, if you're trying to do that, but. The, the, the permanent long-term trust, I would tell you, you want to have a little bit more substantial assets so that it can pay for ongoing cost of having it be in existence. And how long does it take to, the process take to set up a trust, John? You know, it, it all depends on the schedule of the person drafting it, really. Um, you know, I, I've done trust as quick as 24 hours in an emergency, uh, but but that's not the norm because that's dropping everything and then you you get charged a premium for that when it's a it's an emergency sort of situation. But the you know usually the 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 correct process that at least we go through is we send out what we call an estate analysis form, which is about a nine page form to help us collect the assets of somebody. They show up to the first meeting, whether it be by Zoom or in in person. They send us that form. We walk through the form. We talk about what their estate planning should look like, what they want to do. And then we draft documents and send them out to them. Usually it takes us a week or two or three, something like that, to get draft documents out. And then they get the draft documents, they review them. And then it's just a function of how fast they get back to us with any changes or the rest and when we can set a time to sign them. So, you know, usually from beginning to end, about a month or, or a little bit more to kind of go through the full process because. Typically, people's schedules don't line up quite as well as we like them to. And, you know, it just takes some time to go through the drafting process. Okay, we have a few more questions, but I would like to encourage everyone to go to the chat box and hit the link for the survey. We would like to continue to have these. 
but we need your input for an evaluation to see how we did today or some things we need to improve or some comments. So please go to the chat box and hit Survey Monkey if you're going to leave us and make sure you fill out the evaluation for us. We have about four more questions and then we'll be done. So John, can a named agent in a power of attorney change the terms of a revocable trust? It depends. Under Georgia law, if the power of attorney allows it, which under the new Georgia form, that's one of the boxes you can initial, allow my agent to change or amend my revocable trust. If you've initialed that box under your power of attorney and the revocable trust specifically grants the power of attorney, the uh, power of attorney, the right to amend the trust, then yes. But if those two things aren't true, no. Okay. When doing a revocable trust, a revocable trust, is it routine to put a time limit or sunset clause in it? In other words, if XYZ is in a trust, you can say that the trust ends and all assets will be divided up by number of heirs in the trust. Yeah, I mean, the trust the trust will have what we call a perpetuities clause, which says it'll be done after 360 years. But yeah, most people do want to sunset a trust. Most people pick a time, some event, whether it be the death of, you know, the child or their death or death of a grandkid or what, whatever it is that's the trigger event or, or as they referred to it, the sunset event. Then, yeah, I mean, most trusts will have that and have some sort of term or, or process that that happens. And that's really a function of what the person setting the trust up wants it to be. I mean, and that's so we've done a lot of different triggers over the years that, that can be done. OK, so which is more appropriate for a husband who is disabled and needs a caregiver and no children but stepchildren? The husband is on a state funded program that limits his income and resources. OK, I would tell you, you probably would need to be setting up some sort of Miller trust for his income if he's got it. And on top of that, some sort of special needs trust for him if you don't want to disqualify him for benefits. And so a spouse or a third party can set those up and avoid them being accountable resource. But you certainly want to make sure that it's structured correctly and done uh, if you're trying to keep the government benefits. OK, and. If Tom left everything to Thelma, his wife, in a will, but Thelma doesn't have a will when she dies, does Tom Jr., Tom's son from a previous relationship, inherit everything, or does it go to Thelma's sister, her next of kin? Well, yeah. If if Tom leaves everything to Thelma, and hang on, I, I think I saw that. I was pulling up the comment, and I saw that question. Uh, where did it go? I think I just put you it just, in. You just killed it. Yeah, if, yeah. <laughs> if, if Tom leaves everything to Thelma and Thelma doesn't have a will, then Thelma's intestate heirs will get all of the property. And if Tom Jr. is not one of Thelma's heirs, that's exactly right. He's out. Okay. So, so what, we'll go what Tom should Thelma's do is leave sister. a trust in his will for Thelma. And then at Thelma's death, it goes to his son. Okay. If he wants to protect. If that. he wants to protect Tom Jr. Yes. Okay. 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 And you already talked about property taxes and a personal owner. So we've already right. done that one. And I think we need a little more clarification, a quick and dirty again, how a trust is funded. Okay. Trust is funded simply by changing the title of the assets over by signing the back of your car title and filling it out, just like you were selling it to a third party. You would title it to the trustee of the trust. Deed, same thing. Just like when you sell your house to a third party, you sign a deed that gives it to the third party. In this case, you'd sign a deed that transfers it to the trustee in the trust. Um, and, and bank accounts, you'd set up in the name of the trust. Beneficiary forms, you designate to the trustee of the trust as the beneficiary. Okay. And one last, oh, I think that is everything. If Brenda or someone, if you would talk about um, how they can get the recording. And I think yes. there have been a few questions about having the PowerPoint slide. Thank you, uh, Keyshawn Thomas. Uh, first, let's thank our speaker, uh, speaker attorney Dunspot. Uh, so glad to have you with us. Great information. I did hear the questions uh, in the chat. 
about the PowerPoint slides. Uh, they won't be shared, but this presentation is being recorded and it will be on the Fort Valley State University Extension uh, web page. Uh, so you can go there and view that after a few edits, um, perhaps in a day or so, if you'll check the FE uh, FESU Ag page and you will be able to view this recording again in its entirety. Uh, also, I think uh, if we know that some of you uh, have to leave, please go to the chat and uh, fill out that survey for us. Just click on it. It only takes a few moments to fill it out. And that gives us feedback of what we are doing and how we've been able to serve you, how we can serve you better in the future. We being Fort Valley State University uh, Extension Program and the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, so I have three um, that survey is in the chat. That link is there. So you can go ahead and fill that out. Uh, again, we want to thank Attorney Dunsbach uh, for being here. want to thank each and every one of you for registering for this program and joining us. We could not have done it without you. We hope we've been able to share uh, informative information that can help you on your estate plans as you move forward. And I certainly want to thank also the committee of Georgia FITS. Um, thank all of uh, my colleagues on this program. We've all been working hard to bring this to you. And uh, thanks, thanks to each of you for uh, all the roles in, that you've played to make this possible today. And I thank you, Attorney Dunsbach, as well, for staying over and doing questions. We know we're a little bit over time, but I think we've cleared, uh, Keyshawn, all of the questions that were asked. Uh, I have saw some feedback as well about what an excellent presentation this was, and they got some very informative information is what I've seen a couple of notes in the chat. So I wanted to share that with you, uh, that everybody was pleased with the presentation seems like, but we do need that in the uh, evaluation. So please share that before you leave everyone through the evaluation as well. Uh, I believe that's it. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Mark Thomas if he would come on briefly and wrap us up uh, with final thoughts for today. Again, thank you. Uh, Mark, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Brent. I appreciate it. Um, I think y'all have pretty much done an excellent job of wrapping up and giving everybody their marching orders, but I do want to re reiterate one more time about the evaluation. It is a very important piece. It is in the chat and is in there several times, so we do ask if you're still on with us, complete that, and we'll stay on and give you all a few moments to uh, complete that. Also, about the recording uh, being uh, it is on our FESU Ag YouTube channel, and I put that link in the chat box as well. So if you give us at least about two weeks because it has to go through editing and some approvals uh, before we can post it on that YouTube channel. But it will be out there because I saw that several people asked about uh, it is a lot of information and it's a lot to digest. So you can go through that YouTube channel and watch at your own leisure and at your own pace. Again, thank you to everyone who came, Attorney Dunsbach, all the people who helped put this program on behind the scenes. You're looking at them on the screen. And thank you all, the attendees, although we can't see you, we appreciate you and thank you for participating in this program. You all are the reason why we do this type of work to bring this type of education to you. And we want to continue to build on the success of what we started and hopefully we look forward to seeing you all in the future um i will put a caveat out there we are going to do a face-to-face -face meeting on estate planning sometime in august and it will be held on the campus of Fort Valley state university so we look forward to uh, reaching out to you all and hopefully see you all in person at, at that time and with that i say thank you